Good morning. Okay. Today I'm gonna try to discuss the role of healthy lifestyle in the promotion of uh, health and longevity and in the prevention of um, multiple chronic diseases. So let's start with the first, let me move the video here. So let, let's start with a couple of important concepts. So the first one is what should be the goal of medicine? To me, the goal of me the, the primary goal of medicine should be not treating diseases, chronic diseases that are typically taking between 20 and 40 years to develop, but to prevent the accumulation of metabolic and molecular damage that is leading to the development of multiple chronic disease. It's just a matter of time and genetic predisposition, which is the one that you are gonna we are gonna develop first, but eventually, if we if we live long enough, we are gonna develop all of them. If we if we are performing an healthy lifestyle, and again to promote health and successful aging. Now, what is the definition of successful aging? To me, the definition of successful aging is the ability of human beings to avoid chronic diseases and disability and remain, let me restate, remain physically and cognitively healthy, happy and creative, empowered, contributing to social and productive activities, active and most importantly, independent for as long as possible, ideally for the entire life. Okay, now here, one of the problem, well, I mean, this is not a problem, this is a success. This is a, a success of our technology, modern medicine, our understanding of disease, all the public health uh, discoveries and advancements that led to a doubling of lifespan between 1850 and 2010 and now, basically. In 1850, the average lifespan was around 40, 45 years old, now is around 80, for males and 84 for females in most of the developed countries. That's fantastic. This is simply amazing, you know, and uh, we have to be proud of this achievement. However, there are some issues. One issue is the increase in percentage of people older than 65 in uh, older adults. For example, in US, we went from 4% in 1900 to 13% in 2010, predicted 20, 21% 20, in 2040. So one in five, of Americans going to be older than 65. In Australia, uh, it was 9% in 1926. It's going to be 15%. It was 15% in 1976. It was 25% in 2016, predicted between 24 something around 2050 okay in my country italy we are already at 21 percent predicted 34.4 percent in 2050 this is amazing 
and is, as you can understand, unsustainable unless we do something about it. Because in 20, 30 years, one third of the Italians and Japanese and many other countries, developed countries, is going to have a population that is older than 65, one third older than 65. But what is really bad is the combination of this aging of the population with the prevalence of chronic diseases. For example, this is a paper in 2011, US data, as you can see here in 2008, basically more than 90%, only 8% of people in US older than 65 had no chronic, uh, had no chronic disease. 90% or more had at least one chronic disease and 70% uh, um, had two or more chronic diseases. These are, this is a paper, these are data that we just published in Aging Cell with Vincenzo Attella. And as you can see here in Italy, these are data from collected from 900, by 900 GPs from more than 1 million uh, patients. Th these data have been electronically entered by these physicians, so they are not self-reported. And as you can see here, basically, uh, 90% of Italians older than 65, they have at least one chronic disease and 65%, they have two or more chronic diseases. And more chronic disease me means, you know, more medications and more problems of the combination of the side effects of these medications and hospitals admissions. And in this paper, we also discuss, we also have data on the, uh, on the costs of these, uh, comorbidity is huge and unsustainable. For example, this is a statement of Senator Harkin in US. Uh, basically, he says that uh, the US is not, the, the US model is not a healthcare system, but is primarily a sick care system because it has been estimated then of the 2.9, basically $3 trillion spent in US in 2013 on medical care, 86% was to treat illnesses after they occurred. Okay. And these are just data from a New England Journal of Medicine paper showing that basically, as you can see here, the, the, the average per capita spending went from 11,000 uh, US dollars expressed in 2002 value to 158,000 in people older than 65, okay? So basically, This is not uh, sustainable again. So which are the major cause of deaths in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in Western countries in general? Okay, heart disease is the number one and it's around 30, 40% of the cause of, total cause of deaths. Cancer is the second one, around 25. Cerebral vascular disease is the third chronic lower respiratory disease due mainly to smoking and pollution. Then there are accidents, diabetes, influenza and pneumonia, Alzheimer disease, and then all the other ones, nephritis, nephrotic syndrome, nephrosis. Okay. This is an important, very important slide. Let me see if I can move uh, here for the moment. 
So I put together this slide because I think it's really important. So as medical doctor, medical students, we are used, we have been taught and we are as doctors, we are thinking in silos. So as you can see here, these are all the spe medical specialties, uh, the main one at least that, you know, we see in a, in a hospital, you know, and, uh, and, 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 and as you can see here, let's, let's look at cardiology. I will say that 80% of the disease that we see in a cardiology department uh, are in some way related to, they are caused by abnormal metabolic and molecular factors that are due to unhealthy diets, excessive caloric intake, physical inactivity, smoke and stress. We are gonna come back to this concept, but you know, just to show you, coronary heart disease, heart failure, periphery, peripheral arterial disease, aortic aneurysm, aortic dissections, atrial fibrillation, then some of the ventricular arrhythmias, diabetic cardiomyopathy, Alco alcoholic cardiomyopathy, chronic venous disease, these in some way they have all to do with these unhealthy lifestyle factors. If we move to neurology, even here a big chunk of the disease we see in the neurology clinic department are ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, diabetic neuropathy, idiopathic intracranial, intracranial hypertension, vascular dementia, probably Alzheimer's disease has to do with unhealthy metabolic factors. And uh, there are accumulating data that even multiple sclerosis has some um, metabolic inflammatory alterations that are modulated by nutritional lifestyle, especially early in life when the immune system is developing. Then we go to oncology. You know, we think, you know, that oncology has nothing to do with cardiology. But in reality, if we look at the most common type of cancers, and in particularly, in particular, of course, lung, that is mainly due to smoke and pollution, but breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, endometrial cancer, esophageal cancer, gastric, gastric cardiac cancer, pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, gallbladder, kidney, renal cell cancer, ovarian cancer, urinary, urinary bladder, and oral cavity pharynx, the smoke and the papillomavirus infection that is also lifestyle related. All these cancers that are the most common and prevalent cancer, they have in common in some way metabolic factors that are uh, caused by these unhealthy lifestyles that, you know, are here, you know, in blue, as you can see here. Okay. Now let's move to endocrinology. Obesity, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, osteoporosis, Pneumology, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that is the third cause of death in many developed countries, smoking, lung cancer, smoking, obstructive sleep apnea, obesity, hyperventilation syndrome, obesity, pulmonary embolism, problem with, again, obesity and um, disorder of ventilation and asthma. There are data suggesting that, you know, the gut microbiota, our diet has an effect, especially early in life in the predisposition to develop asthma. Then we move to nephrology. I will say that basically between 40 and 60% of the the disease we, we see in a nephrology department are due to unhealthy lifestyle. So diabetic nephropathy, depending 
that in general it's around 30-40% of the diagnosis in the nephrologic department. Hypertensive uh, artery nephros nephrosclerosis, so atherosclerosis. Renovascular disease, renal artery stenosis, chronic kidney disease, nephrolithiasis, so stones. Benign prostatic hyperplasia, lower urinary tract symptoms, erectile dysfunction. <clears throat> Again, these have to do with an healthy lifestyle. Then, you know, gastroenterology. Uh, here, you know, even more gastro, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, Barrett's esophagus, chronic mesenteric ischemia, pancreatitis, nuffle disease, now the major cause of liver disease, fatty liver disease. Alcoholic hepatitis, gallbladder disease, with all the complication of gallbladder disease, the verticular disease, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease. There are again more and more data that these autoimmune disease have to do with the abnormal development of the immune system due to uh, unhealthy lifestyle, especially nutrition. And then gynecology. Abnormal menses, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uterine fibroids, and you know uterine cancer, sexual dysfunction, infertility, gestational diabetes, and then you know we have uh, ophthalmology. Di diabetic retinopathy is the first cause of uh, blindness in Western countries, macular degeneration, hypertensive retinopathy, cataracts, rheumatology, osteoarthritis, gout, fibromyalgia, and rheumatoid arthritis probably have to do with an healthy lifestyle. Psychiatry here is a bit less clear, but there are more and more data suggesting that stress and physical activity and healthy diets may have an influence in the development of anxiety disorders, chronic insomnia, probably depression, autism, even if for the two one, it's the data are still accumulating, but there are more, more and more psychiatrists that suggest that, you know, there is an, an inflammatory background, a metabolic background to the development of many mental illness and finally geriatrics you know the major it's sarcopenia frailty and aging after aging okay so again you know this is extremely important because what we are saying here is that you know basically between 40 and 80 percent of the common chronic disease that you know we see in our hospital are preventable because they have a common metabolic substrate that has to do with a number of unhealthy lifestyles, excessive caloric intake, unhealthy diets, and probably in the next lectures, we're gonna go into the details of unhealthy diets, physical inactivity, smoke and stress. And again, uh, because, you know, uh, so it's, it's important, you know, that you know, uh, medical students and physicians, they realize that oncology and cardiology, they are not two different independent silo of disease, but you know, here is a, a slide that I prepared for a review article that I wrote for Nature Review Cardiology, but you know, basically, this slide summarizes as well my, my idea. So again, you know, we have mental stress, sedentary lifestyle, excessive caloric intake, unhealthy diets, smoking here. And then, you know, we have, um, okay, smoking. So as you can see here, as I said, you know, how these lifestyle factors are, are responsible for metabolic and then we'll see molecular uh, uh, abnormalities that are linked to many, to many of the common diseases we see in our hospitals, in our clinics. Well, you know, there are several mechanisms 
the important one is that you know sedentary lifestyle excessive caloric intake and even mental stress through an activation of the sympathetic adrenal activity are responsible for abdominal obesity and really abdominal obesity is an increase in waist circumference a deposition of visceral fat and excessive visceral fat it's well known internationally accepted that abdominal obesity is responsible for a number of metabolic abnormalities primary, primarily insulin resistance but also inflammation if we have excessive uh, abdominal obesity we uh, we are producing more inflammatory cytokines we published that you know for example in diabetes showing that you know visceral fat is a major source of interleukin 6 and then of course insulin resistant diabetes that develops into diabetes um, abdominal obesity is also associated with dyslipidemia low hdl high triglyceride elevated blood pressure oxidative stress and all these ones are leading to multiple cardiovascular nephropathic diseases so we have you know all these are risk factors for coronary heart disease uh, that can develop into myocardial infarction but also to into of course you know this small uh, infarction can lead to heart failure or hypertension to heart failure smoking of course is influential in many of these diseases and smoking copd and asthma or um, and then you know of course stroke both uh, hemorrhagic through hypertension and uh, and uh, the classical uh, atherosclerotic based stroke vascular dementia and probably through inflammation or stress and other risk factors also probably alzheimer's disease has to do with these abnormal abnormal metabolic factors but what is interesting is the link between these lifestyle factors and the increased risk of cancer because you know when we have insulin resistance because we have an excessive deposition of abdominal fat visceral fat you know we produce more uh, free fatty acids more inflammatory cytokines less adiponectin and this insulin resistance is causing a hyper secretion a compensatory hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance at the liver level is also reducing steroid hormone binding globulin that is the transporter of testosterone estrogens and igf bp1 and bp2 who are the transporters of igf1 so basically insulin resistance is causing through this metabolic adaptations hormone adaptations uh, an increase in free bioavailable estrogens testosterone and igf1 that with insulin are powerful anabolic growth factor that are promoting cell proliferation are inhibiting uh, apoptosis and they are increasing um, they are causing genomic instability I'm going to tell you something about it in, the, in, in these or probably in other lectures. We're going to talk about cancer, how these metabolic abnormalities are driving cancer also at the molecular level. Of course, inflammation, dyslipidemia, obesity is uh, responsible for one of the major liver diseases right now that is NAFL, uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease. And then, you know, we have, uh, of course, the unhealthy diets, you know, this lipidemia is also due to a high saturated fatty acids diet, you know, salt and low potassium and magnesium with low intake of vegetable fibers, oxidative stress are also probably due to unhealthy diets, chronic nephropathy, you know, with uh, diabetic and... Uh, and uh, hypertensive atherosclerosis and uh, and then you know there are other ones that are not here but you know unhealthy diets probably a low fiber diet is also responsible for the increase in as we will discuss in many uh, allergic and autoimmune disease going from 
multiple sclerosis to type 1 diabetes and um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease and many others. And finally, mental stress has an effect in cardiovascular disease and uh, high blood pressure, anxiety, insomnia, depression that are also influencing many of these factors. And you know, these factors are also influencing with inflammation and insulin resistance, sarcopenia, frailty, and accelerate the accumulation of molecular damage leading to cells and S and other. Um, metabolic and molecular factors that are driving aging. Okay, this is another important slide. Why? Why is it important? Because, again, in our medical system, what we do typically is to treat disease that typically they occur in this, in this part of our life, mostly in this part of our life, so in their 40s, 50s, early 60s, you know, because it takes many, many, many decades for damage, molecular damage to accumulate. Many decades of abnormal lifestyles, abnormal risk factors and metabolic adaptation, as I showed in the previous slides, are accumulating over years and eventually they they end up in a clinical disease and you know now with medicine with modern medicine we are able to you know control the symptoms to slow down the progression with drugs and therefore you know we can accumulate multiple chronic disease and have complicated you know patients with complicated disease and multi drugs and multi problems that is making our healthcare more and more and more expensive and unsustainable. So this is a, again an extremely important concept because again the accumulation of metabolic molecular damage starts since the fetal life, and there are more and more studies showing that you know probably starts even before, even in before we the, the fetal life in the preconceptional age, and that's why I think it's crazy the idea that you know we are going to solve every disease with a new drug so the idea is you know don't do, don't worry do whatever you want you know we are not training our medical students to know anything about nutrition exercise lifestyle med mindfulness meditation so basically they know everything about how to make a diagnosis of disease they know everything about drugs how to treat disease with drugs and surgery but they, they know very very little about you know how lifestyle are impacting metabolic these common metabolic substrates leading to multiple diseases and again now this is crazy because you know because many of the alterations that are in epigenetic alterations that are predisposing people to develop disease occur during the fetal life no doubt about it in the first, you know, during, during winning. And again, you know, more and more, more data are suggesting that even as a, a, the, the epigenetic changes occur before uh, conception. In fact, you know, there, there, there have been, you know, a couple of weeks ago, a special uh, number of articles on The Lancet, you know, discussing the importance of preconceptional healthcare and so health prevention for you know uh, controlling the epigenetic changes that are leading to uh, kids with a higher predisposition of developing a, a number of uh, disease as they get older and so i think you know that's one of the reasons why these strategies this idea of concentrating all our attention to the development of, of new molecular targets, new drugs uh, that, you know, they can treat disease when we are in this stage, it's, 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 it's wrong. It's, it's totally wrong because again, you know, things are happening here. And so we wait here. And so, you know, we are not addressing here. And so there is no, no way, you know, we are going to treat people before conception 
before, during the fetal life with the toxic drugs, you know, to change the epigenome of, of, so, of, of these individuals and the predisposition of their kids to develop disease. So I think, you know, healthy lifestyle has to become an important, an extremely important part of our healthcare and, and the education of our medical students and not only our medical students, everybody. On, on, in a, in a, on campus, in, in, in every university should have knowledge, both theoretical and practical knowledge on how to stay healthy and how to understand the implication of what they are doing on their health and the health of their future kids. And that's exactly what, uh, just to summarize, you know, we have a series of major problems at least from a, from a health point of view. Again, you know, we have an aging of the population. We have an increased number of unhealthy elderly individuals with expansion of morbidity, people living longer in poor health. We have a, an epidemic of abdominal obesity and healthy lifestyle that is making things worse for the sustainability of our healthcare systems. So this is a, 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 <clears throat> an article that you know I wrote with uh, Brian um, Kennedy and Walter Longo for Nature in 2014. You now this is our current approach, as I said, you know, waiting for disease to develop and then treat them once one at a time with drugs and surgery. This is a disease-centered approach. We think that is essential to at least you know have a parallel approach that is prevention center but not just you know eat more fruits and vegetables exercise it's, we we, ha we know better than that you know we know the metabolic molecular pathways and we are getting better to understand those that you know can be blocked so you know that we can block the damage upstream so that you know we can prevent the damage to occur or we delay the accumulation of damage so you know we can prevent multiple disease you know with one intervention or with a combination of for, to be lifestyle intervention okay and we know that that's possible we know that's possible because and that's you know the the, the beauty here of science let me see the beauty of science you know, this is a paper, you know, we wrote for science with Linda Partridge and Walter Longo. And uh, what we have, this is a summary of the science of many, many, many scientists, many smart colleagues. And what we have been discovering in the last few years is that uh, aging is regulated by uh, multiple uh, molecular pathways but one of the most important is the insulin igf1 mTOR pathways so these are key nutrient sensing pathways and what we know is that when we down regulate these nutrient sensing pathways in red are you know all the animal model of longevity so these mice are living significantly longer and are significantly healthier than their the, 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 the wild type control mice and again what they have in common the great majority of animal model of longevity is a down regulation of the insulin adjacent to pathway and we can obtain that you know with diet calorie restriction we're going to talk about intermittent fasting protein restriction methane restriction then we have a number of genetic or animal models so now we can knock out one gene or, or uh, overexpress one gene along this insulin different mTOR pathway and we see basically an increase in lifespan and health span and then you know we have a drug rapamycin that is a specific inhibitor of mTOR that is increasing lifespan so now we have multiple evidence from multiple interventions showing that you we can manipulate aging in yeast worms flies mammals and whenever basically we knock out you know we we, we inhibit these nutrient sensing pathways the animals are living longer and healthier so now we have a tool we have a mechanism so we don't have to you know, rely on epidemiological data where we can really have a model to study aging and the disease of aging can, that can be applied for 
primary, secondary prevention of multiple chronic disease and for the promotion of health and longevity. What we have discovered in the last few years is that things are more complicated than color restriction. When I started to work on, on color restriction 20, 20, 25 years ago, the dogma was that only calories were important for the promotion of health and longevity, for the increase in maximal lifespan. Now we know that it's not true. We know that apart from calories, the distribution of the calories during the day, during the week, so fasting, intermittent fasting, uh, time restricted feeding, we're going to talk about it, maybe in future lectures, uh, the content of protein and the quality of proteins for the composition of amino acids are extremely important for regulating aging and pro-cancer, pro-disease pathways. We know that what we do is also changing our epigenome with long-term effects in terms of predisposition. We know that the, 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 what we eat is also changing our gut microbiota and therefore is changing the development of our immune system and our brain uh, health and but with immune system changes through especially early life you know we are shaping the immune system and the predisposition to allergic and autoimmune diseases so we're going to talk about this is a review article i wrote with linda partridge on these topics that is summarizing what we know on on these important uh, topic of how different nutritional intervention can impact different metabolic and molecular pathways leading to multiple chronic disease. Of course, it's not only, it's a bit more complicated than nutrition. We know that, you know, our genes are important, but, you know, it's based on studies on identical uh, twins homozygous twins, only 25-30% of our probability of living a long or short life is due to what the genes we inherited from our parents and 70% at least is due to environmental factors during our lifetime and probably even before our lifetime with, pre, pre, with epigenomic change, epigenetic changes. And so the, our genes, however, are interacting with the environment through diet, as I discussed, but also exercise. Different types of exercise are impacting different metabolic and molecular and physiological pathways. Probably we're going to discuss about it. Then, you know, cognitive training, we know is very important. We know, you know, that, you know, the brain is like muscle. So if we train our muscle by, by learning new, always new things, you know, using different parts of our brains, you know, you know, that has an effect in, 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 in slowing down the, the, the atrophy of our brain. We're going to discuss about this as well. And then, you know, the sleep, the importance of sleep in, 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 in many metabolic in factors, you know, in, in, in brain aging, you know, we'll also discuss about it in, in probably in, in Alzheimer's. There are beautiful papers showing that your know, sleep deprivation has an effect in in the accumulation of uh, beta amyloid and tau proteins in the brain, and so in the propensity of developing Alzheimer's disease, and then in cognitive function. And then uh, we can talk about mindfulness as a control for stress and other, prop, and, other, and other diseases and health in general. And then, of course, smoking pollution and medications. And uh, that's it. You know, I think, you know, I tell, I told you something. I didn't tell you something I think is very important. We're going to discuss about it in another lecture, the, the interaction between what we do and the environment. Because, you know, as a human beings, you know, we are not living in isolation. Let's say, you know, that, you know, we are doing everything we can in terms of lifestyle and we are super well, we are healthy because we exercise, we eat the appropriate amount of calories, proteins, and fibers, and phytochemicals, and vitamins, and we are doing yoga, mindfulness, everything. We are not smoking. But if even with this lifestyle, we live in a super polluted town, you know, where, you know, the concentration of particular matter, it's very high we are going to have a much higher risk of developing diseases, cancer, or um, 
chronic respiratory disease that are going to kill us. So I think, you know, what we do and we're going to discuss about it, it's very important in determining the health of our environment and back our health. And so when we discuss and when we think and design interventions, we also have to think about, you know, what we do impacts the environment. And again, you know, I'm going to talk about it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a specific lecture. And uh, I think that, you know, I told you what I wanted to tell you for this one. And so thank you for listening. Bye-bye.